Yo, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Caravan Sarai. Nice to see you guys. Hope you're doing well. I hope you're safe. I hope you're healthy in crazy times. You know, I, I was. An for that. Is there something else I can help with? Siri was going a bit crazy, but I um, I've been thinking today that actually, for the first time, isolation is starting to get I don't to know me. What you mean by Siri? I'm getting a bit crazy, but I am. Siri is going wild right now. Right. So I've just been thinking how much isolation is starting to get to me a little bit. There are moments of the day where I've just kind of been staring into space and just like time flies. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but um, I'm ready to tap into the real world. Uh, and Wednesday nights have been an opportunity to do that in very remote, isolated times. For those of you who are just joining us, welcome. For those of you who it's your first time joining a caravan sarai, um, it's based on the concept of a, a caravanserai in Central Asia and Middle East, which was a pit stop for travelers and nomads on their way to somewhere. Um, they would be come together and they would share stories and, and trade goods and they would uh, come together in a very eclectic, diverse groups. And it would be a beautifully dynamic and eclectic space. This is our modern version of that, the caravanserai on Beni. And the idea behind it is to kind of bring people who have had incredibly interesting journeys and learn so it might embellish and decorate our own diasporic journeys. And I think it's fair to say over the last few weeks, we've had some incredible guests and we've learned a lot and it's been a roller coaster of emotions, but also intellectually expanded our perspectives and our minds together. And that's the whole point of this is also to democratize ideas. Uh, a lot of these really interesting conversations happen on ivory towers. How can we give access and expose a wider audience to benefit from the perspectives of people? And this is what we're sharing. We're sharing perspectives. We're not sharing absolutes. We're not sharing closed concepts. We're sharing perspectives. And I think there's something incredibly humble and, uh, and uh, in accepting a perspective for what it is. So I'm really grateful when people have the courage to share for our own benefits, the breadth of their own experience. And today, um, <laughs> I'm super excited today on another level because this is someone who I have learned from more than probably many people. Um, in the beginning, it started from the shadows and he, he was probably one of the first people I followed on Instagram. And for the last 10 years, I am not exaggerating when I say that he has been a reference for me, a guide, a role model, but also a facilitator and, and a motivator for my own work. Literally everything I've been doing at Benny is based on what he did, what he started. And the work that he did built the landscape for creators like myself to be like, hey, there's an opportunity for me here to make it a bit more relevant to the world that I'm living in today. So um, um, I don't want to kind of compliment him too much because I know he'll get shy and embarrassed, but it's fair to say that Joshua is one of the archetypes or pioneers in shaping in the beginning what was Black identity in America. Um, he opened up the boundaries, the parameters of what it meant to be a young Black man in the States and from his work birthed, I can't, even, I can't even count the amount of work that I must have inspired and given birth to. Um, and he grew out of that space even, and he was able to, as an entrepreneur, grow into an even bigger macro level where he started to have real institutional change of structural racism in the States. And we're going to be breaking down his genesis from the beginning of where he started in the Bronx in New York and kind of learn in stages, what made him do what he did at particular times. Now, just to give you structure behind what we're going to be doing, I think personally, real profound, interesting things happen at transitions. They happen at a moment of you were thinking one way and then you transitioned it into another, into a, or you gave birth to an idea. But a lot of these things get lost. Like, how did you get from here to here? And Joshua is a perfect example of being able to like connect the dots. So I'm going to be focusing on three transitional points in his life. Um, and that's how we're going to structure the conversation today. Now, without further ado, I would love for everybody to give a very warm welcome to Joshua Kissy. Joshua, make yourself be seen. If you could unmute and show your wonderful face, my boy. Hey, how's it going? I feel like oh like, my god, up. I was like sitting behind the scenes, like, uh, what am I supposed to do in this time that he's talking about me? <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to relish it in and just absorb it. 
because like it was it's actually a really empowering time because i know you would have cut me off if i'd given you the opportunity to be like yes nah, nah. definitely like yeah no no stop stop it there stop it there <laughs> um no this is beautiful this is amazing it's a pleasure to be featured and thank everybody for for tuning in thanks bro how you been have you been keeping healthy you been keeping safe? yeah i just yeah absolutely i just came from a run um <clears throat> and every morning i try to start my day with the run to kind of like just kind of ease the mind and especially since i live in queens i live in new york and it's one of the hot spots for the pandemic. Um, yeah. So I've just been trying to find small moments of just like reality and spirituality outside. So looking yeah. at the trees, looking at the birds, just like coming back to my senses. But it's, it's funny because I would take those things for granted um, if it wasn't because of the situation we're in right now. So when I normally go on runs, I'm just looking at the time. I'm looking at how I need to get back to the house in order to do the next thing and the next thing. But now I've been enjoying just being present um, yeah. and just, taking in the natural beauty that God has blessed us with and just being like, oh, wow. Like, yeah. I, I resonate with that. Are you kind of hoping to take some of those lessons with you? Like, I'm, I'm trying to think like, yes. the kind of level of presence that I've had, are yeah. these things that are just kind of like an isolation fad or will they carry on with me beyond when we can be exposed to the real life again, you know? Hopefully, I think, I think habits turn into us um, as long as we find they're justified because it's interesting, like, there's a lot of things that we do out of habit that don't necessarily benefit us. But imagine the things that we can implement now because we see the kind of direct benefit of like being present or, or doing the things that feed you. And I think now knowing that as much as I love social media, there's no type of feed that's going to actually feed me the way that real life does and the way that real relationships does. So yeah. I just been kind of taking that as a, as a pathway. Beautiful. And like New York has been hit hard. Hard, like, man. Hard, hard, man. And, and like, have you kind of felt, I know you've been personally yeah. impacted by it, but like, can you still feel it in the city, the kind of impact this whole pandemic has had? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think outside of being in New York, living in Queens, living in a very black and brown neighborhood, like you see kind of the disparities when it comes to who's affected and how they're affected. Um, so yeah, I live right by Elmer's Hospital, which is like one of the bigger um, institutions and hot points for, for Corona, right? And I went over there like one morning I ran and I went over there and I started speaking to some of the nurses and some of the intel who were helping. And they were just like, you know, two weeks ago, we couldn't even see anybody. Mm -hmm. There's literally like stepping over bodies from bodies and bodies of people yeah. that passed away. Um, so it really makes you really take into account how serious this is, even if it's not in your backyard. It's affecting a friend of a friend of a friend, especially how we're so connected on the internet now. 100%. Um, I've, I've lost dear loved ones because of this uh, virus, unfortunately, but just choosing to be more optimistic and kind of honor them through life and celebrate them in different ways. Beautiful, inspiring already. Um, <laughs> now I'm loving like we got a lot to get through today because uh, <laughs> there's lots to dissect. So I'm gonna encourage people that, especially the, that a lot of people are on this and the young creatives who are tuning in on YouTube or Zoom, uh, a lot of you are aspirational creatives. Now, I really encourage you, if you have something to write down, take some notes, because I know I've learned a lot from Joshua, and I know you guys will too. So I think there'll be lots of moments through this conversation that I will have big takeaways. And uh, I, I, I encourage you to uh, uh, note this down. If you do have a question, um, message me privately on the Zoom chats and, and tell me if you want it to be a public or a private question. If you want to say it to yourself, just put public and you'll be able to come on um, um, publicly do that. Also on the YouTube audience, you are more than welcome to ask questions as well. I'll do my best to facilitate that. Right, Josh, <laughs> let's start. Let's build a context for someone that might not be uh, yes. accustomed to the work that you do. Where did you so, grow up? Where did it start? Absolutely. So I'm born and raised in the Bronx to Ghanaian parents. Um, I'm pretty sure most people know where Ghana is or it's, it's in West Africa, right next to our competitors, Nigeria. Um, mm. But yeah, we're, we're, we're right. <laughs> so right in West Africa and I was born and raised here in the Bronx in this community outside of Ghana this is the biggest Ghanaian American community in the world right so yeah. very much grew up with a lot of the values and traditions and and how we would kind of look at life uh, from an identity perspective but I was also very American as well right and the, yeah. and the tricky thing about blackness is like even though I could speak another language I could speak multiple languages my native language and as well as other languages as well like because you live in America and you do have the skin tone that you have, you're um, automatically assumed to be African-American um, until people have a conversation with you or maybe they see that you look a little different. They see your parents always in traditional clothing and speaking a different language and cooking different foods. That's when people are begin to inform themselves like, okay, like you aren't a JB and JB is another term for just black. 
And that's mm-hmm. what um, a lot of people say here in the States when they say you're just black, they mean that you're a native African-American person who um, are descendants of people that were taken through the transatlantic slave trade, right? So yeah. there's that big difference that I had to kind of decipher. Like I was like, okay, I have all these layers to me as far as being African-American like literally being African, right? But being American, yeah. but then yeah. outside of that also being um, Ghanaian American um, and, and the Ghanaian heritage that my parents would kind of live on day to day. Like once we came home, we spoke our language tree at home. There was, there was yeah. no space for English, but when I went outside, I was very much a black American kid. Right. So it was, yeah. there was a lot of dynamics at play that I had to kind of figure out for myself. Were there peers to kind of like resonate on that level with, or did you feel like that was quite an isolating experience and you were going through that alone? Um, I mean, there was a lot of other kids that were from the Caribbean. I was from other, you know, Nigeria and like, other places as well. Like, so I think for them, we bonded over that, but we bonded over like the American piece, like the American piece is what held us all together. Yeah. Um, but our respective heritage is, is what probably we kind of respected as well. And even sometimes, you know, those, those things are what people would normally have jokes with. Cause I grew up in a very Latino neighborhood yeah. as well. So like, yeah, you know, all the typical stereotypical jokes that kids would be mean with, but a lot of times we found solace and peace in the connectivity of being from somewhere else. Like the fact that you went home and spoke another language um, and was proud of it was like a thing. But there's also some kids that really wanted to assimilate into African-American culture and yeah. kind of not wear their you know, Caribbean flag or, or whatever, West African or African or from anywhere else, right? Because there was that pressure to, to just be black. So that was the most accepted, accepted kind of form of identity. So um, yeah. There was also a path for that. So as a young man navigating all of those multifaceted, yeah. multiple identities at the same time, what did you feel didn't exist that you really needed at that point in time in your life? <clears throat> That's a really good question. I think um, a reference point, right? Like I didn't see many people that were like me that were in the arts and creative or even had a definition. Like if you were first generation, like what did that mean? Um, why do you come? Like people come to countries for different reasons. Um, whether academic or refugee or immigration or like there's so many different ways to migrate to a country. Um, so I think for me, what I was missing was like that reference point from the diaspora. Like what does a diasporic um, definition and, and vision look like um, in America, right? From a black and brown perspective. That was something I was very, very interested in, but didn't necessarily see because everybody's trying to funnel into this American identity um, yeah. and kind of do away with those layers. But like, even like, even right now, Joshua, like the way that you're explaining that is quite articulate. Did you even have that kind of vocabulary as a young man growing up? No way. I didn't. I just knew I felt connected, but I also felt alone in some ways. Um, So I knew there was like something to be done. And, you know, my parents, my mom worked in the hospital for years. My dad was in the church for years. So like a lot of my sensibility came through community. So like the way that a hospital heals people, the way that the, a church or a religious institution heals people, like a lot of my upbringing was through community. So there was always people in my house, whether I knew them or didn't know them, like there was just people at home because my, my parents wanted to show love to them in different ways. So, so when I was a kid, that was annoying, right? Like, oh man, <laughs> my room was being taken over by uncle, whoever, who just came from Ghana, right? Yeah. But uh, like, I, I learned to get adjusted to that as well and get adjusted to the experience and the beauty of people and community. That's beautiful. Now, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, for me, this is transition one. And transition one is what we've established right now is that there is a need. There is a need for a young Joshua to figure out his place in a very multifaceted world where he has to navigate his multiple identities. Um, mm-hmm. Transition one occurs when you decide to creatively express yourself. Yes. How does that look? How old are you? Where did it happen? Um, I feel like... At the age of 16, 17, I got interested into cameras. And if anybody doesn't know, I'm a photographer today. Um, but I got interested in taking photos because I felt like those are the only things that stood the test of time. When I looked at family albums, when I like understood and like just like really went back to memories based on looking at images, I was like, yo, man, there's something powerful about that. But of course, in that same time, that's when internet and social media is very much becoming a thing. Um, so I knew that posting a photo on the internet was sort of like traveling around the world in a sense, right? It's kind of like having a global passport, like very early internet before Instagram, before like the platforms we had today. I was very much on forums, I would research, and I just found the internet to be 
like so so just like inspiring like i got my first computer um and it was a gateway computer it was super big and like the whole 56k modem thing where you had to get your parents off the phone in order to use the internet like very throwback internet life um yeah. but it made me kind of like realize like man there's something to be said on a global platform and the internet just kind of makes it that much easier to do so um so i worked at an amusement park bought a camera and <laughs> like from there i just kept going with it i was just like man i started taking photos of my friends and as well as myself as well um and family and like at traditional occasions but all the way also to like fashion and style stuff and that's how street etiquette was born in that sense you know um, beautiful so street etiquette yeah was born from your job of in an amusement park where you saved up for your first camera yeah and street etiquette what was that what was the blog like yeah, why so street, street etiquette yeah i know right so street etiquette was a, a blog and website co-founded by myself and travis gums he's of west indian descent i was of west african descent and we were both well he came to america when he was like 7 or 8 i was born and raised in the states so we had this like connectivity in a sense um and it was beautiful because street etiquette was very much so very early internet on a black expression platform like what it what it meant to express yourself as a black person right like that blog and website was that but we did it stylistically so it was like a fashion blog slash style um and that's the way we kind of communicated and we didn't know at the time but a lot of people had perceptions about how you should look what you should dress like and especially being young black kids from the bronx and as well as in the states we understood the power of dressing differently but as well as why so street etiquette is a website where we broke down clothing items Oh wow, awesome. <laughs> This is fancy, some right? <laughs> hey, fancy IT is here. Um and this is all from, you know, pre-2016 probably. Some of his 2012, some of his 2010, some of his 2009 as well. Um but all we did was just kind of show these different narratives that we felt like should be talked about because we didn't see it. Like there were you know the GQ magazines and the Esquires and all these reputable platforms but we just didn't feel like we had a voice and platform on there so we were like you know what let's tell our own stories yeah. and honestly it was a beautiful thing because it wasn't just about myself or Travis there were so many people that so many of you guys it was like a gang like a proper gang yeah pretty much it was like you know this person's a writer this person's a singer this it felt like this new wave renaissance movement when it came to the internet as far as black creativity black expression and what that meant like this and a lot of story yeah and a lot of these people are like doing their own thing right now as a result yeah everybody's killing it doing their own thing which is which is great and it all started from just community just meeting and being like hey this person identifies just like me like how do we empower each other how do we continue to like lay down a path of what this could look like 10 years from now and i started when i was like 16 17 and you know now at 30 it's 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 interesting to see how impactful and influential the work was but like Talk to me about this uh th this interest in and passion in fashion. So you already cultivated this deep interest in photography. Yeah. But how did fashion come into that? I think clothing was like the easiest way to express yourself creatively and artistically and I think from a, a just a urban youth, right? Like growing up in New York City or London or Paris or however you like there's always this fashion and style expression like how, like every youth movement has some sort of like expression of how they want to look at themselves whether it's you know in the 80s in the 90s in the millennium so i think for us we wanted to make our own stamp but as well as we knew that there was always people that dressed good like it wasn't about dressing good like there was always cool people but i yeah. think we found power in actually documenting it and putting it yeah. on the internet for other yeah. kids around the country or around the world to be like oh that's me like i don't necessarily have to fit the mold of what blackness is supposed to look like i could yeah. be myself and i see other people doing the same so why not so like on a daily average we would get like 100,000 to 200,000 views just on a blog website and yeah. like at that time i was like oh that's that should be i think that's normal right like i didn't really think of it but now i'm like wow like you're getting a quarter of a million views a day on content yeah. that you and your friend just created just because right and yeah. uh we found so much impact in that like i it changed my life But like fashion like for me as an observer watching that and then not having known you at that time I think what the thing struck with me you just said it your, yourself was how like I am getting imagery of what it meant to be a young black man that wasn't popular culture right 
it wasn't like twerking it wasn't like rappers it wasn't like you know a yeah, we wanted to like show a whole different facet yeah and it was like liberating to see actually like and, and the interesting thing things about clothing is that we all do it everyone gets up in the morning the first thing you innately do is put clothes on right and it's that relatable medium of taking ownership and control of something that you wear it's mm -hmm. almost like a metaphor for like I'm taking control of the way I'm being represented. Yes, absolutely. No, that's true. Okay. And that's this, true. And that, that's what, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I said that's true. And, and it came with different definitions of it because even in our neighborhood, growing up in the Bronx, we walk outside with, you know, a varsity, a cardigan, some petty, yeah. nice a tailored pants. Too. Yeah. yeah. Like people are threat, like our peers, like we got the most, I don't want to say hate, but we probably got the most tension from people that look like us in the same age bracket because they felt like, we were trying to look better than them or we were trying to depict ourselves to be uh -huh. better than how they were because we didn't dress exactly. And it was like, there was a lot that went into that. A lot of psychology that goes into, you know, most older people are like, oh my God, I, lo I love the way that you're dressing, which is, you know, nice to get a compliment like that. But younger people in our same age group and our peers will be threatened a little bit. So we'd have some squabbles and stuff like that. But it was, it was just like, wow, like if clothing could spark this much <laughs> yeah. like tension in people, like it, there's the identity behind it. It has nothing to do yeah. with the clothes. It's just more so like how do a person sees themselves when they see you, you're like yeah. a direct reflection of that. And if you don't actually accurately depict that, then, you know, there may be tension there. There may be tension or maybe love. And, and it just depended on who we saw and who thought what we were doing was, you know, Uncle Tomish or gay or et cetera, like yeah. just whatever, right? Just like that that toxic masculinity was also a play, like a man should never wear this or like, why are you dressing yeah. like this and et cetera, et cetera. So it's also opening people's mindset of what masculinity looks like on certain levels. That's super interesting. And like, I think like the sartorial element of it um, was almost like, I, I think the one thing about oppression is that you can't really imagine yourself dressed in a way that reflects how powerful you innately are, right? And like, and I think there was something really empowering in like witnessing that. Um, and um, that fashion element just totally, totally fascinated me. But like in the in the juxtaposition of, you're still in the hood, right? Yeah, you're still in the like, hood, still in the, yeah. yeah. And like people are wearing like three piece suits and they're looking dapper yeah. and they're looking fine, but then you're still seeing like the train station and the subway and it's grimy yeah. and it's dirty and it's, it's yeah, something to really play on in that juxtaposition. Yeah, you're still seeing a lot of crime and a lot of, you know, and we just try to be a little bit of a light within yeah. that, you know, and I think that's that's what made us feel like, wow, if this is invoking this much emotion, we have something here and we should. Yeah. There's probably a lot of people that feel just like us. Yeah. Um, so when we started to tell our own stories and then it went viral, we did this editorial called Black Ivy. Um, and it was very Ooh. much about I know <laughs> it was very much about showing black men on a college campus. And it sounds so simple now, but for like. 20, what was it, 2010, um, 10 years ago, it, it was very much different. Like we built this website, we penned it, we had all our friends kind of partake in it. And it was just imagery. Like now it seems kind of normal, but 10 years ago it went viral because people just didn't see black men on a college campus. And it sounds so benign. It doesn't sound like it's a big deal. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But it was something that shook, shocked the internet, but as well as it was our first viral piece of content. And it was all about just breaking those barriers of what people would expect as far as acad academics, because sometimes it feels like there's a certain type of acceptable black person that can make it to college or make it to universities. And what we wanted to show is just like, there's all different types of people within the black community that could do so. And I think we did that very beautifully, but there was a message behind that. Um, and from there, like, that's when we turned more into a brand, right? Like we did this editorial and it went viral um, and it was featured everywhere. And then before we know it, a lot of brands and clients started to email us and be like, hey, can you do what you did there, but just for us in this way? Um, so our first job was actually with Nike and we were 18 years old. And we like, we weren't even legal to, in, in the States, you can't drink at 18, right? So it was just interesting. Oh, actually these images here were from Howard University um, in the 1950s and we found them and we just loved the style. We loved like the grace that they had. And it was like, Really, really cool because it's like 1950s Howard, Washington, DC. If you don't know, Howard is a HBCU, which is a historically black university. So we took inspiration from that and brought it into a modern lens. This and is the thing that's crazy lot. to me. This is the thing that's crazy to me though, because like people used to d dress really well back in the day, like yeah, regardless no. of what class you were from, 
right? Even yeah. working class people, they were donning the yeah. suits, they looked sharp. But then somewhere down the line, we started to like wear clothes that didn't really like self-respect, you know? They were, they were, they yeah. was kind of didn't really care. Yeah, it, it came more casual, it came more sporty, especially in the 80s and things like that. But I, we used to love this. Like, I mean, I still do. These images still speak to me in so many different ways. Um, but we wanted to change the perception of what um, intelligence looks like, acad academia looked like, and just be young and be proud. So it was, it was, it was very much a transformative time and yeah. it made so much work opportunities out that. And we didn't even know, right? Like here we are photographing, we're styling, we're writing, um, we're art directing. And these are all job titles. And we, we had no idea at that time. We were just so passionate about it. It's yeah. like a brand like Nike would come to us at the age of 18, right? And this is way back. And they're just like, hey, like, we'd love for you to work on this campaign. And like, we didn't even know what to charge. You know what I mean? It was just that much like we didn't we didn't study into the creative industry or media marketing or advertising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any did of it. That. Yeah, we just did it because we we're passionate about it. So it was just like very much a, a beautiful moment to yeah. kind of see where we came from when I was 18 years old and working with Nike, which was one of the first clients to now be in 30 and still working with them in some facets and working with many other companies. But I'll say this, like after that Black Ivy editorial, we got featured in New York Times and it was like a six page article. It was massive and it, it featured like what the redefinition of the black man is. And it was interesting, right? After yeah. that, we had a ton of clients hit us up and even like McDonald's hit us up, right? It was, it was bad, but they were like, hey, like we would love for you to like dress up and like, you know, put the burgers in there and like maybe do some like spoken word around the burgers. It was bad. We said yeah. no, essentially, um, no matter how much they were charging. But think about it, it's like two kids in the hood getting all these opportunities really quickly. And but we still knew like long term vision was something that was important. And that's what we stood by. But now that's easy to look at because you have influencers, you have a whole macro influencer market right. Um, right. and what that looks like. But 10 years ago, none of that like Instagram didn't even exist, you know, so. Yeah. It was very much like you had to figure it out on your own. So like, let, let's go back to that moment where you started to realize, holy cow, I'm getting mad attention yeah. for my yeah. creative output, yeah. right? Yeah. And like, yeah. I imagine as growing up in a neighborhood where like creative opportunities were so scarce or right. you didn't even imagine that you could be the beneficiary of a creative opportunity. Yeah. When you start creating something just from pure passion and then suddenly these big people start knocking on your door, what's the psyche? Like, what are you thinking at this moment? Like, is your brain able to compute what has just happened? Are you thinking yeah, this is I mean, my on life? Some, on, yeah, on some level, I, we were present, but I could say personally, I wasn't too present. I was focusing on the next thing. So I was always like, okay, this is a great opportunity, but like, we got to do the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And I think at that time, I was like, essentially, I'm like, oh, wow, I could actually pay bills with this and I could actually make a career out of it. And, you know, having African parents or having any type of immigrant parents, they're like, nah, <laughs> you know what I mean? My dad was like, no way. Um, yeah. So I had I had some squabbles with my parents, but for the most part, my dad sat me down. He he saw everything that was happening. He was just like, "Hey, like if you really want to do this, you could take out the, the next two years." Because I didn't go to uni fully, right? So yeah. he's like, "You could take out the next two years and do this. And if it doesn't work, that means you have to go back to school, and we'll pick the major for you." And I was like, "Hell no! Like there's yeah. no way I want to go back to you school." Gotta and make it work. You gotta yeah, make it work. Like, <laughs> gotta make this work so in that coming time like i was able to um do a lot with street etiquette we we're able to like get the right press get the right clients and i just mm -hmm. showed them like hey look and they were just so happy and so ecstatic and they started support from that time but i think my dad wanted to challenge me as a man in the house and be like hey like you say you want this thing you've been doing it for a bit um this is the crossroad you're either gonna really do it or you're gonna yeah. just do it as a hobby so how do you transition from doing something you just like to actually live off of what you're doing. And that challenged me for sure. But even for like diaspora parents, that's still pretty like open-minded, bro. Yeah, he's no, he, they were open-minded. We still had some back and forths for sure. But at the end of the day, that was like the conversation. He's like, hey, you yeah. came into my room. It was just like, you have two years, two years yeah. living in this house and doing what you're doing. If you could, yeah. if you could show that this is, this is something that you could actually do and be monetized, we won't ask any more questions. All we do is we'll support you. And that's what happened. You know, like most diasporic moms, they're going to go with what the dad says is very patriarchal, you know, yeah. household. So like whatever my dad said, such so he was such a figure of the family and figure of like Ghanaian culture. That's yeah, kind of yeah. what, what went. So I was yeah. just like, okay, I have his confidence. I have his, you know, support. 
but it also made me not want to hide in what I was doing. Now I was just like fully yeah. myself. Cause like before I was like saying I was going to school, but I wasn't going to school, man. Like yeah. I'll put on my book bag and like get out the house and not go anywhere. Yeah. Pretty, pretty bad kid, not a good example. But essentially I came to that truthful moment where I was like, I can't hide this no more. Yeah. I just kind of need to be honest. Yeah. So, so this is another like transitional point for everyone yeah. who is an aspirational creative here from turning your passion into something that you can actually conceivably monetize, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for you, what was the first brand that knocked on your door that made you think, oh, cow, man, like this is crazy. Like, like it was definitely Nike for sure. Nike, of course, McDonald's, but that was not the right fit or the right client. But definitely mm -hmm. Nike definitely made us think different. Like, wow, like this is a billion dollar brand in Portland. So you and Travis kids. like bouncing heads off the wall, yeah, like, holy like, cow, is that Nike in the building and like freaking yeah, out? We, yeah, they flew us out. They like did, yeah, they flew us out like first class, like this, this everything, right? So it was just, it was interesting to be like, wow, creatives are kind of being treated like athletes, like in a way, you know? Yeah, um, because like that vision and storytelling is so important. Um, so we worked with them. And then after that, we did a five year consulting stint with Adidas. Um, and then we went to Germany for a bit. So yeah, it was, it was very much interesting to see like, wow, you could really live life off of this, but also yeah. knowing that nobody else in your culture and your community has done this. So yes. you kind of need some reference point or you need right. something to know, like, how do you maintain this? Right. And that's like always been the vision. So for you, like if, if for you, the opportunity for you to monetize your passion came from uniquely providing something that never existed before. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Okay. And I think that's a lesson for all of us, like is replicating work that exists right now might not necessarily mean further down the line that it's monetizable. You need to provide something into the space that's true. that didn't exist before. That's true. And I think back then, if I look 10 years ago, the jobs or titles or positions or, or creative routes that we wanted didn't exist yet. So you kind of have to create being present, but knowing that the thing that you actually want to do probably doesn't exist yet, but just keep doing what you're doing. Because yeah. those building blocks will help by the time you get there, you'd be like, oh man, I'm glad I took on those other positions. So now yeah. this is like a real defined thing because the market has come around, yeah. people have come around, things has changed. So like, I think it's super important to be present in your work, but also know that the title that you want or the thing that you may imagine yourself doing may not exist in the industry yeah. and that's okay. But like, we know what's really interesting about, yeah, okay, you start making some bank and like you yeah. can start paying your bills, but actually the most valuable asset that I perceived was the cultural income yeah, and the cultural value that street etiquette had acquired in that period, right? Yeah, because now yeah. you guys had become like, you become household names. Everyone yeah, respected yeah. your brand. They respected yeah. you. And for me, that was the most valuable thing out of those, those initial years, right? Yeah, I think it was the trust because you, you build a community. Um, authenticity. Yeah, authenticity for sure. Not, I mean, selling out, I guess, is whatever definition you want to call it. But I think it was always about the people and people could see that within our brand um, back in the day. So I think that helped me leverage anything else I wanted to do in the future, right? Just having a trust of people, not just having a name because a lot of people have a name, but actually having like a reputable voice and not just an echo um, was very, very important because I stuck to what I believed in. When, and what I believed in was like, yo, diasporic voices matter, right? Like black and brown voices matter. Like how do we continue to build what that bridge looks like to all these different islands, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that that was like the starting point because Street Etiquette was a place where it was like a playground. You just we just did whatever because we wanted to. We had an office, yeah. we had staff, we did like we yeah. just did it because we could, right? And yeah. at a certain point, it was just like, okay, what's actually necessary? And that's when I started to kind of open up the palette a little bit. Yes, and that feeds nicely into transition number two, right? Yeah. And like, um, we've taken a long time to talk about, to build the context of who Joshua is and the initial work that he oh, did. Good. But actually the real juicy stuff happens from here. Well, in my opinion anyway, because you take it to another level. It's almost like, oh, you're a Pokemon and you evolve, right? <laughs> like you take it from the Bronx and what it means to be a young black American. Yeah. And then yeah. suddenly you reconnect with heritage and culture and roots. And that's on a global scale, right? Yeah. And I think no, um, no point really reflected that than your trip to Ghana. Yeah, and yeah. Um, can you talk me through that? What that felt like yeah, being able yeah. to reconnect oh, heritage and roots. So, growing up, we've always went to Ghana. Like every summer, like a lot of immigrant families, you go back home, you visit your village or town or city, um, and that was really important to do, right? 
So it took me a while to get there. I was going and going when I was growing up, but by the age of like 16, we stopped going because it was just too expensive. Those tickets are like $2,000 from direct from New York to Accra. Um, so yeah, like I waited a bit, like I waited till I was like 26, 27 to go, but like going to your home country is very different when you go on your own compared to going with family. So I went on my own. I told my parents like, Hey, I'm yeah, going to buy a ticket. I'm going to yeah. figure out where to stay. And yeah, you know, yeah. they're going to hit you like, just make sure you speak to all these people. Yeah. Just, yeah. hundred like, percent. These are like, auntie number one and auntie yeah, number two. Like, 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 you yeah, got to yeah, do yeah, a whole yeah. house visit, right? Yeah, like you got to hit every, you got to like possibly stay there. You got to like eat at the yeah. table when you're not hungry, yeah. all the stuff you go through. Right. But um, like what I realized was like, I went not to like save or like be a savior for anything creatively. I just went to listen. Like I went and I didn't want to say anything that should be happening. Cause I was well touted in the industry or, or new. I just went and listened to people, whether it's older folks in the community, whether it's you know, young creatives. I just listened the whole time. I didn't want to talk too much because there's this expectancy of when you go back home that because you're foreign or because you left and we have a word for it called a brony or whatever, like you may know better or whatever. Like I didn't want to create that type of tension. What I wanted to do was just go back and listen because I knew that no matter what, just because I've been living in the States or our family's been in the States or in the West doesn't mean I necessarily know what's best for the local economy and know what's best for mm. local creatives. So I was just like, no, I don't want to come with this savior concept. I'm just going to come and listen and partake in. That's important because like there's an etiquette of being children of diaspora, right? Mm -hmm. And it's yes. like also like acknowledging that there's lots that we don't know. But yeah. then do, did you feel, did you feel not at home entirely coming I mean, into the space? Yes and no, right? Because I speak the language, I understand it, but at the same time, I'm, I still look how I look. I still present how I present. And Ghana is a very, it's a very beautiful country, but it's also very uh, conservative and religious in its own ways, even though it's very expressive and friendly, but people have a certain image of what they think you're supposed to look like. So piercings, dreads, anything that's going to make you look out of the box is very much anti, like they don't really necessarily connect with that. It's not until recent years that they have, but a, for a lot of immigrant communities, they just think it's like, yo, it's clean cut. You know, no beard, no hair, no anything, just be as acceptable as possible so you could get where you need to get. Like you need to look as acceptable as a man or woman mm -hmm. for if anybody sees you in the street or families, they won't talk about the family. Like, oh, did yeah. you see this person's son or daughter? Yeah. Um, so yeah, as a society, that's how they move a lot of times. So when I came in looking at how I looked, they probably, they just thought I was a soccer player or some type of singer. <laughs> That I was visiting. That's the in their head. That's the only way that I would be walking around doing what I'm doing, yeah. right? So yeah. So so why why did Joshua Kissy of Street Etiquette need to go back to Ghana mm. to evolve and develop? Why was that necessary to take you to the next level? That's an amazing question. I feel like it's it's always in a genesis. Like the genesis is is so important. Like understanding your why, understanding your beginning, because. Even if my parents never went to America, I would still be a Ghana, right? I'll still have that identity and and identity and culture to kind of go back on. But it's like just because I'm in the West doesn't mean that I leave everything to the back or leave leave everything to rest. You know what I mean? That's that's the bar. <laughs> just because yeah, you're yeah. in the West doesn't mean you can leave it to the rest. No, but it's just like I just really, really thought that there was a connection and felt it. Um, and knowing that like our culture, like a con culture as an ethnic group. It's been going on for so long and I only knew so much of it just through oral history, right? Because especially in our culture, there's not a lot of tangible paper things that say like, you know, in 1692, this person did this. And like, yeah, yeah. it's just passed on through lineage. Like if you know this family, if you know this, like this is a word of mouth history and word of mouth culture. And I want to hear more of that, but as well as like, put out a narrative that actually looked like what the people felt in Ghana and not what the West thought Africa is essentially right where it's just a starving um poverty stricken impoverished like i wanted yeah. to kind of do away with those things and show more positive narratives but as well as truthful narratives so yeah. i'm not saying those things don't exist but they just don't represent the whole of the culture and i knew coming from the west i didn't want to come in and try to talk about what should happen in another yeah. country even if it's my mother country because yeah. like there's still space and grace for the people that are native born to have a voice a hundred percent but like yeah, totally agree with you. And it's also, I guess, like part of this growing sentiment being felt that like young black African-Americans can feel deep pride 
in their heritage and their roots yeah. on a on a deeper level, right? And we're seeing that in popular culture as well. Black Panther couldn't exist yeah. without yeah. the preliminary work that was done to get young Black African Americans to that point. And that's true. And I think, especially Ghana, has been a touching point for a lot of diasporic Black folks because, like, in the 1950s, like we were the first country to get our independence on the continent. So there's a lot of things um, that were at play. Our our founding president was very much a Pan-Africanist and that's what he preached was like, as, as long as you come from this continent, no matter where you go in the world, like you're very much of this mm. continent. And I think that was important um, mm. for even African-Americans who, who sometimes feel that tension, right? Where it's like the slavery aspect and as well as potentially being sold by other Africans or being sold by other people that look like you to the West. Um, there's so much tension that goes into those conversations. So for me, being born and raised there, I'm very, I'm very aware of the privilege I have, um, but as well as because I know where I'm from and I speak another language and I have a culture, like mm. I, I also want to acknowledge that African-Americans very much also have a culture, but even within like primitive mindset when it comes to African parents or a lot of immigrant parents, they really think African-Americans don't have a culture. Like mm. they're just here, like figuring it out. And like, this is why they are. But for a long time, even my dad, he was just like, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't because of African-Americans. Like they really fought a fight of civil rights and human rights for us yeah. to exist as immigrants coming to the States in the seventies to have that. Yeah. And the thing is honestly, like a lot of communities, whether Asian, black or brown or et cetera, like have benefited off of the civil rights of black people fighting for the greater rights of themselves. It, 100%. Like yeah. I mean, I speak for myself and like the only reference I had growing up because I think, especially with the kind of brown community, these narratives hadn't been quite shaped or formed as eloquently as they had been in the black community because there was longer, you guys had longer to develop those narratives, yeah. that my references were the black civil movement, right? Like wow. these were people who I saw as like role models. There's a reason why like Malcolm X and his autobiography was like yeah. the perennial book, which gave me a sense of grounding in my sense of self. Yeah. But it's, yeah, so like it, it was channeled through that movement itself. But one thing I wanted to ask you, is going back to Ghana, um, how did it impact your own creativity? Um, because felt, I'm speaking, felt, like, as a, as a fan of your work, I felt like there was an evolution, right? Like, well, they definitely, absolutely. I think once I went back to Ghana, I'm like, I, just the way I looked at color and texture and, and people's stories just elevated. I don't know, it just, it became more so ever clearer that these types of images needed to exist. like just needed to exist as a reference point, even for people that are back home. Like they have a certain, sometimes people back home have a reference point of their own country through the West. And I was like, no, like I want to kind of do away with that and show a little bit more of a truthful image. And it doesn't need to be the only one. It could be multi. The thing is like, we're just fighting for multiplicity. We're just fighting for nuance. We're just fighting for depth. We're just like, that's what it is, right? Like how can we provide more of that rather than just a narrow image? So I was like, the more nuanced, the better, the more better, the more beautiful, you know what I mean? Like the, to me, the beauty is in the details. And that becomes like very much a standard of how I approach photography or image taking. I'm like, yeah. as nuanced as it gets, as far as your identity, your sexuality, the gender norms, the gender roles, whatever it is, like I want it all. Like, and yeah. I want to see it all. And I want that all to be appreciated as well. Yeah, amazing. Okay, so Donna. And then we have a kind of a different kind of tone for this yeah. next transition is you meet someone who evidently <laughs> means a lot to you. And I've asked as a precursor, I've asked, I've told Josh that I'm probably going to bring this up. No, but cool, you man. meet someone who is incredibly um, beautiful inside and out. And she's really yeah. dynamic and eclectic. And you decide that you want to spend the rest of your life with her and you eventually mm -hmm. marry her. But yeah. she is of Ethiopian background. Yeah, absolutely. Born in the States, but of Ethiopian background. Yeah. Yeah. And how did that kind of, I think what happens is a tendency to think like African-Americans getting married, there isn't a cultural identity crisis, yeah. right? And that's really interesting because there is, there's a deep cultural crisis. Ethiopia and Ghana are very different cultures. Very, right? very, yeah. And that can play out in a relationship. Yes. And I would love to get to know on a personal level, yeah. uh, was it an issue? Um, uh, if so, how did it play out? And, and how did you guys reconcile that? I think for us, like why we initially connected is because we had immigrant parents and we very much understood what an African parent could look like and feel like. And some of the pressures you feel, whether it's schooling and 
the pressures of how to be a good son or how to be a good daughter um, it was very much related on both of our paths and for for us honestly like I just love her because of her heart, right? Like, I was like, yo, this person has an amazing heart. Yeah, she's beautiful. Yeah, she's like all these characteristics, but like, it's really her heart that made me feel like I want to have a heart like that. Like, that's what transformed me is her heart for people, her heart and her love for people. I was just like, how can I get a love like that? So that attractiveness was like the common thread of how I saw my wife. And it's crazy to think now, but yeah, my wife, she's she's my wife. We're about to go on a <laughs> one year anniversary. Like what? Damn, um, I'm married. married. <laughs> um, and let's talk about okay guys also a bit of context this was and i'm being 100 serious this yeah. was the wedding of 2019 <laughs> and you guys think i'm playing you guys have seen the kind of level of like swag and drip to associate with josh now yeah. hold up hold up i managed to oh my god you're gonna pull, I, up, I managed to pull up some stuff and so just for the sake of embarrassing no, I, I think our wedding was recognized a lot because it was intercultural um and it was we showed our culture through our wedding, which is beautiful to do. Um, so I wore my traditional Ghanaian garment. She wore her, um, she wore our traditional Ghanaian um, attire as well, but as well as like- Can you see that? August, we did the Milsi, which is like a traditional Ethiopian um, attire as well. Um, and yeah, the Kente, like the Kente is the fabric that I'm wearing. That was straight from Ghana when I went. And yeah, like it's, it's a very regal, material that only is lent for um yeah just big occasions and every every thread of the material is like by hand and that's what they do so you got to go to this certain part of this town and village and like ask for the fabric and they do it by hand and they deliver it to you and that thing was so heavy that joint was like a hundred pounds <laughs> fabric um that you have to like kind of wear and the gold is for royalty of course ghana used to be known as the gold coast so gold is very much one of our highest ep imports that's our milsi which is our ethiopian wedding which was fun um and it, it really had me learn about you know diaspora communities and how we navigate the world right because here i am on the other side of the continent realistically as a Ghanaian man but taking part in a very ethiopian eritrean um tradition called the milsi so like early in the morning like the family comes over and they're like, you know, don't take our, don't take our daughter. There's all this like acts in play that you gotta like go to the house and get her and like do that whole thing. I'm pretty sure other cultures do it. Well. <laughs> yeah, you know, like ask for her hand and get it from the family. Then they cook in. It's just a lot, but it was beautiful. Yeah. Like it was, it was yeah. very, very much beautiful. It's different from Ghanaian culture. We have a, a process called the knocking process, and you go to the the lady's house and you ask for her hand as well. But both families are there, and then. You, you know, they play games like they make other women put on the, um, they, they put you blindfolded and you have to choose your wife and like all that stuff, right? Like yeah. a, a lot of our cultures have iterations yeah. of this like it's knocking beautiful. engagement process, but it, it really taught me. I was just like, man, like our wedding was, it showed you so much as far as what people saw when it came to the pressures of marrying within your culture. Cause like growing up, my parents were like, yeah, like marry, you know, marry who you love. But low key, they really wanted me to marry somebody from Ghana as well. <laughs> like, they're like, oh yeah, marry anybody. That's cool. But then they're like, uh, no, actually, could they be of this culture? And it gets so intricate, right? Because not even just the culture, like there's certain ethnic groups that your parents want you to be with within yeah. the culture, like over another. Like, oh, those people, they don't, you know, they don't know how to save money. They're not good with money. They're not financial people. Where the like, there's all these like stereotypes and nuance that go into even our own countries. Even yeah. if you married somebody that was just like you, there's still all these pressures and nuance and stereotypes that go into that. 100%. So I think for my parents understanding like, hey, we live in America, we can't control everything these kids do. You're gonna find love where you find love. Yeah. And I think my brother, he married, his first wife was Japanese and his next wife was from Czech, Czechoslovakia. Wow. It was like, they were like pretty much open. They're like, hey, we're here as long as they're a good person. Yeah. They believe in some sort of God, awesome, yeah. great. Um, that's and beautiful. for me, once my parents met Mectus, they were just like, she's amazing, she's great. And this is like, Ethiopian culture is a very insular, like, you know, yeah, they, they feel like they're, they're the country ancient. and yes, yeah. ancient as well. They feel yeah. like they're the country and culture that hasn't been colonized because yeah. they've never been colonized. So they, that's their thing. They're like, we've never been colonized. We can't mix with people that have been colonized. You know what I mean? It's very yeah. much like, <laughs> it's very much like elitist in that way. Yeah. Um, and because they have some of the most ancient religious texts in sure. history when it comes to the continent in general. Yeah. So yeah, there's 
there was never from our families there was never any like angst or tension yeah. her mom loved me her dad loved me just like a son and my parents did the same for her so Beautiful. we met on instagram so for everybody that doesn't know it like, can happen yeah, guys it, it can happen, happen. You know, all right get off the tinders <laughs> tinders like it's not happening on that that's a very different kind of love story <laughs> <laughs> no it happened it happened on instagram which is cool um and it changed the trajectory did you like, did like, you like slide you said in the dms first was it kind of um i think i did but i was only responding yeah you did my boy no, no. <laughs> but hold on but i'm also only responded to her comment so she kind of slid in the comments first i don't okay so technically she did technically we'll disagree. She, she got the comment i went in the dm so i don't think it's, it's my thing but it changed my life that dm changed my whole life now we together here in queens um but oh, yeah that intercultural the biggest um, lesson from joshua today Slide in that DM. You never know yeah. when it might change your Take life. Take the chance. Take the. You just never know. <laughs> you never know. A year later, she was living in New York. A year from that, well, two years from that, we were engaged, and now, like, we got married, and we're coming on like, one year. So it's been five years total. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's it. It all happened, and so, I think even sorry, real quick, even before asking for her hand, I understood. I did my research on her cultures. On wow. Her European culture and being like, okay. If I'm gonna ask her dad for her hand or her mom for a hand, what do I need to do to make sure I'm respecting Yo, as well? Um, that's that that's happen? deep. <laughs> and like that, there's a lesson in that. Like in all seriousness, like if you're really intently serious about someone you love, then you need to do your homework. Yeah. Right. And uh I think that's that's actually yeah, you turned that around really well, my boy. No, um <laughs> another thing I wanted to ask you is before I'm mean, time's running out, but I wanted to ask you about like as someone who draws from your cultural heritage in very deep and profound ways. Um, have you thought about how that's gonna play out in a mixed household? Like how can you instill a deep yeah. sense of Ghanaian-ness yeah. with a deep rooted sense of Ethiopian-ness at the same time? I know, that's a tricky one. We talk about it all the time because you gotta kind of have a, a similar vision of what you want your household to look like. Yeah. Of course, we want it to be centered by love and God and the things that are yeah. important to us and faith. But outside of that, like we very much want our kids to identify as Ethiopian, Ghanaian, American, right? So I think speaking the language or understanding the culture, like all oh, those things are so important, especially when you marry interculturally, like you have to do more work. It's just a part of it, but I'm willing to do the work. I'm like, hey, if, if, you, if your mom needs to stay here, if we need to have them have a summer in Ethiopia or Ghana to be more intact with their roots and understand a little bit more of who they are. 100%. That's important. Like that's that's a sacrifice we're willing to make. And it's not really a sacrifice, it's like a necessity. Beautiful. So I think I think for us, that's where the standard is. Like yeah. there's nothing below that. We have to make sure our kids, uh, as much as they feel Ethiopian, also feel Ghanaian and American as well. Love that. And I hope that notepad I told you guys to take in the beginning, you guys have jotted that down because there's something really profound in that. And that's, Yo, if you're serious, you got to put the hard work in. You and that's with work, work and that's your partner as well and the relationships that you build. Um, Josh, that was that was super powerful. Now, we've reached a point where you're settled and the, the probably the most latest transition or maybe the penultimate one, another transitional moment is you are now established as a yeah. cultural uh, influencer, as a diasporic representative. Um, you are known in the scene and, and lots of people look up to you. And you have an influential profile. Yeah. Now, you do something that takes it from a profile into something that is deeply institutional change. Yeah. Right? And I see it as that your newest business called Tonal. Yeah. And I'd love for you to tell myself and everyone else here Absolutely. what this endeavor of yours is. Absolutely. So Tonal is a culturally diverse stock photography company. So my background is in photography. Sorry, the bell is ringing. I'm like, should I get it on my way? You do it. Take us with you. Take us with you. We're good. No, <laughs> no, but like, I, it's a laptop. I can't. Hold on. Sorry. I'm going to look at some of what you guys wrote. Man, I'd love to know what questions they asked each other to really find out that sweet spot in terms of how they'd balance both of their cultures. I'd like to know that. I mean, I ask my parents that a lot because they're of different cultures. Um, and what really resonated with me, what Joshua said, oh. is like putting the brunt mic in. <laughs> Everyone just doesn't care about your work anymore. They just care about your relationship and how oh, you really work. cool. I could we could go more in a and relationship. I'm like, guys, like, this isn't why we brought him in. All right. I, no. have some deep I, could, I could speak more to relationship and marriage and, and <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. No, but Tonal um is a culturally diverse stock photography company that was started by myself and Karen O'Conquo. Um and we saw stock photography like Getty and certain um instances, we were like, man, it's just lack of diversity, lack of people 
lack of nuance, lack of black and brown communities and the stories we have. And the way I thought about it, I was like, man, it should be story over stock, right? Like nothing is a, like nobody wants to be a part of what's stock, right? Like of what's just is, you know, what just exists. Like there should be some purposeful, intentional um, thoughts behind the stories we choose to put out there. So I think tonal was like the point where I was like, okay, how can, how can I create something that impacts the everyday industry, but as well as like, how people see the world around them. Because with Striatic, it was a very micro influence. It was like the people that knew, knew, and it was great and it blew up and that was, that was what it was. But with Tonal, I was trying to figure out a way to impact kids that I would never probably meet. Like if a kid on the street that even know who I was or the work I did, that's fine. But as long as he or she was impacted by um, the images we put out in the world to make themselves feel more seen, feel more heard, feel yeah. more connected, then I was doing my job. Yeah. Beautiful. So just to reinstill this point, as a creative, as someone with a platform, we're always wondering how to take it to the next level. How do you deeply institutionally change the society around you? Joshua, seeing that when, whenever there was mainstream representation of, of people of POC backgrounds, there was always stereotypical representations, yeah. problematic representations. And if you go online, you have like Shutterstock, which are basically like these libraries of, of images that mainstream media uses to represent people, right? And whenever you go on them, it's usually actually quite limiting representations of these people. Mm -hmm. So he literally starts a new company called Tonal to offset that balance. And it's basically a POC run uh, stock photography website that stocks nuanced representation of people of, of diverse backgrounds. Am I, is that, was that fair? That's, that's, that's fair. That's fair. So also stock photography was something that wasn't beautiful. So we wanted to bring like this beautiful vision to our stories collectively in the world, right? We're like, yo, as nuanced as the world is, there should be, oh, that's Mechtis there. So that's my wife. <laughs> she, she volunteered her time, AKA. I, free I labor, her. free labor. Yeah, free labor for me. Uh, but no, she, um, it was really, really important to just show our stories in a way that was tangible and in a beautiful and clean um, UI and UX system and like made it come to life. So some of our first clients were like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, um, a ton of companies were just like, why doesn't this exist? Like, how can we play a part in it? And it was very easy in that way where it's like, okay, get a subscription or buy an image and you could support that, that ideology and support that idea, which was super important. But before that, there weren't any sites like a tonal that could, uh, kind of be implemented in how agencies or nonprofits or companies would kind of, you know, use imagery because that's how people see the rest of the world is how you see yourself. So example, you have a Korean family cooking during quarantine, like just like the culture, right? Like how do we make sure we're depicting the culture in a beautiful way? And is, it, um, is, it, is it different? Like, I mean, understanding the need for something like this is that someone of POC background is able to understand their communities on a more nuanced, yeah. layered way than anybody yeah. else, right? Absolutely. So that's, that's where we really took off at. And uh, it was something that really came to mind that was needed in the industry, because I think for a lot of creatives, we think our craft starts and ends with just our craft, right? But I was like, how do you be creative beyond your craft, beyond what you do? Like, how do you impact other people who may look like you, who may not look like you? And how do you provide a solution to a world that says that, you know, your stories, your nuance, your identity, your culture shouldn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, it should just exist in the pipeline. Yeah, beautiful. That's um, incredibly powerful. I think like for me, like why I find that super inspirational is because I'm still finding, I'm still trying to figure out what that transition is for me, um, how to kind of leverage and evolve a platform into something deeply structural and institutional. And, um, and you, you know, it's almost like a golden snitch. And I think what you've done there is really, it's incredible, dude. And I've told you this Thank privately, you. You. but you. I think what you've done there is just kind of really see a need and, and uh, kind of funnel your creativity into it. But you're Thank also you. treading really like, um, and this is the last topic that we're going to discuss today, but you're treading like really interesting territory. Mm -hmm. And that is almost like a pan diaspora experience, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And why it's interesting for you is because you're literally, your journey has been like boy from the Bronx. Yeah. And he wants some representation about black identity yeah. and then it grows. And he wanted to learn about his heritage coming from Africa and what that meant to him. And now you're looking at the bigger picture mm -hmm. and there's a quite a clear evolution there happening. Yeah. Right. And do you believe that you 
as a young uh, as a young black man from your experience in the Bronx and where you've come from, do you believe that there is um, a pan diaspora narrative or a community that is growing that is able to support one another or creatively Absolutely. empower each other? Yeah, that's to me, that's like the vision. That's the goal is to kind of unite the diasporas in different ways, um, because we all relate to some of the similar things. And yeah. even to that point, we live in Queens in Jackson Heights, which is, you've been, it's a pretty Desi yeah. neighborhood, as well as like a Latino, like yeah. it's very, like, you feel like you're pretty much in another country when you're yeah. there. And also like, just like, just to give context to Joshua and like how seriously he takes this. And like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not messing around. I was in New York and we were messaging to meet up and I, this is just when he'd moved and I made the assumption that he'd be on like, he'd be at the, he'd still be at the Bronx or somewhere else, but he'd moved to Jackson Heights, right? So anyone who knows New York and the dynamics of ethnic minorities in, uh, uh, in New York knows that Jackson Heights is like the slough of London. It's the hackney of London. It's literally Desi and Hispanic Central, right? And he had moved from his area of comfort into yeah. an area that he had no kind of cultural, well, seemingly no cultural resonance to. And I remember we're eating, we're sitting at this Colombian restaurant that he takes me because he speaks Spanish. And he yeah. was like, um, we're ordering food and the food comes in. And I'm like, dude, like why of all places are you and your wife, your new wife, gonna come here in Jackson Heights? He was like, there's so much for me to learn here. There's a community here that I know very little about, but I see an opportunity to like elevate my own creative work. Yeah. And that really hit me, bro. That really struck me. And like, I, 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 do you feel like that vision is materializing for you? No, absolutely. Like, I think, especially be, with, within black and brown unity and community and communication, it was just really important, right? Like I've lived in black neighborhoods most of my life, whether it's Best-Eye or the Bronx and like in Brooklyn and like, that was great. But I was just like, what are other diaspora communities when they come to America, when they settle here, when they generationally, what does that look like? And what is the nuance? And what is the common thread that connects us all, right? Because mm -hmm. like the same way I see an uncle down here in 74th, you know, going to the Indian supermarket, like I, I, I could understand he's the same type of uncle that would be in Ghana. That'd be like, it's the same like auntie, auntie and uncle concept of how you look at elderly, how you respect your elders, how you mm -hmm. kind of like insert yourself into the community. I just thought it was really important to understand that um, yeah. and not just have a singular view of what diversity is or a singular view of what dias the diaspora is. I'm just like, everybody's leaving and coming and going with things, but like, what are the things that we're bringing from our countries that are worth it? What are the things that are translatable? Like some things that obviously work for, for hundreds of years, right? But what yeah. are those things that we're bringing to these new places and new spaces that we're finding home in, but is what is those intricate intricacies that I could kind of learn from and kind of reflect back to my own culture as well. So like, I've tried to start like, you know, photo shoots or like photography stuff out here in a course, yeah. big black guy coming around taking a photo yeah. and in a desi neighbor they're like wait who is this guy you know right. what i mean but yeah, like yeah. i get to like touch base with him like hey how's it going like yeah. maybe strike conversation about you know coffee or sports or news or yeah. anything like that but it, it makes a, it makes for a more intentional community like right. i'm not just here because i could afford to be here or whatever yeah. i'm here because i also want our kids to be global citizens yeah. i want our kids to also understand so, that it's like even if a person doesn't look like you or identify as you yeah. there's still beauty to them and it's still a respect that you should give them yeah. um, i so love that to, to move into this neighborhood for me and mechdes was just very very important we're like we want to stay here because we feel yeah. comfortable here i don't feel judged i don't feel like an outsider I'm yeah. very much like here just learning, but as well as like playing a part in the fabric of a very diverse neighborhood at that. I love that, man. And I think that's, I mean, like it's the world that we want to see and ultimately being part of creating it, right? Um, do you feel like, but I do feel like that's quite a progressive way of thinking. There are obviously difficulties with that. And yeah, absolutely. sometimes I feel like maybe the space isn't ready for that kind of expansive diasporic yeah. view because <laughs> yeah. some people are still, maybe not stuck is the wrong word, but some people are like, still ingrained in in the difficulty of their own internal identity crisis right yeah, yeah. To, to open that up to anybody else or allow other people to have a perspective on their own is still quite dangerous territory yeah it is it is tough it is but it's i know i'm coming from it with an intentional um open view and it's, there's no absolutes like i'm just putting a vision out there i'm putting a story out there like it may be a yes it may be a no maybe like whatever it is as long as we're connecting I think that's the important part and like having more conversation because I feel like there's more stereotypes and negative things because of the lack of conversation. Mm. So I'm like, even if we need to have hard conversations, let's have them. 
Like yeah. if you're going to talk about the black and brown community and the tension between yeah. what it is, even like on a, a historical level, like that makes sense. Like, let's talk about that. And it's yeah. more so anti-blackness because whiteness is a thing, right? Like yeah. as a, as an ideology, as an aspiration, as like everybody's yeah. trying to go towards that. But some people don't have a choice because of the way they look or how they present. So it's like, if everybody's not on this sliding scale, like how do we have conversations that actually help all parties understand that there's a common, not a common enemy in per se, yeah. but there's a common ideology that's hurtful to yeah. all people. Even if it doesn't hurt you now, yeah. it may hurt you next week or, or next year. So like, how do we have um, conversation that adds on to that narrative and like 100%. helps to kind of expose those those dark points of humanity in a way. So for me, that was really important. Like I wanted to go to India, shoot a project around colorism and I couldn't go, obviously everything that's happening. Yeah. But I really wanted to go to the parts that weren't really shown and show that even within places that aren't of African descent, quote unquote, like there's still a, a ideology of how whiteness affects countries and 100%. affects society from fair skin to light to brown. It could be from the same family. One sibling may be lighter, one sibling yeah. may be darker and their experiences may just be different based on this, this overarching ideology, right? Yeah. So I just think there's so much more stories in those narratives and that need to be told and have conversation about than anything else. And that's why I was just like, okay, like I wanna open up the gamma conversation that I'm having around the diaspora because that includes a lot of people, not just black people. That's beautiful. And I think that's why I, I look up to you a lot. And I think that kind of way of thinking is inspirational for a lot of us here. And um, I hope we've been able to build like quite a linear genesis of where Joshua has started and where he is right at right now. But would you say at this point of time in your life, that's where you're at? You're trying to figure out what that kind of narrative looks like, the texture yeah. and the fabric. and Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. I think it, it needs to be done, especially from creatives we're kind of called to be, you know, a, a, not a fearless generation, but one that's going to tell the truth. Yeah. You know, and I want like 30, 40 years from now for my kids to ask me like, okay, dad, like what did you do that actually made the world a better place? Like what, what you know, when all this was going down, whether it's Corona or all the racism and Islamophobia and everything we're seeing, like, you know, what did you actually do or think during this time? And I don't just want to hit them with just like, yeah, I just listened and took it in. Like, mm -hmm. no, I actually tried to play a part and what the solution looked like. Yeah, hundred percent. Wow, okay, time has flown. I could go on forever. Um, I wanna give some time for the Q and A's, Josh, I hope that's okay. Um, no, totally fine. But um, um, what have we done? What, what have you talked about today? We've gone through literally his whole life from the moment he was 18 to <laughs> now. We've asked some really intrusive personal questions about his, his wife that he uh, probably didn't want to answer, but I made him to. No, no, um, she's <laughs> really answering those questions. Yeah, but we, we, I think what's incredible about Josh's life and why I wanted him to come into the space is that there is quite a clear, creative, um, linear journey there. And he's grappling with his identity in lots of different ways. It's gone from the moment that he was a young boy just in the Bronx and that the Bronx was his world. Mm -hmm. And it started there. He saw a creative opportunity to represent it in a very alternative, different way. But then it grew a bit bigger and he went to like Africa and Ghana where he expanded his idea of diaspora a lot bigger. And it's ultimately uh, resulted in where he is right now. And that's looking at how do we come together as pan-diasporic communities and see what resonates and see what similarities we have. And how can we have more conversations that are nuanced, that are sensitive? And how can we come together and better the world for our own children in the future? And that's the world that we want to be part of. Now, we got a bunch of questions, Joshua. Um, uh -huh. one, we, one that we got, which I thought was uh, pretty interesting as a creative who's trying to navigate like social issues, yeah. but also like uh, uh, monetizing your, your, uh -huh. your platform. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the questions was, um, what is... What is it like to see commercial success in work that was created by and for underrepresented communities? Do you ever feel uneasy about the sort of collision between the power of the institution mm. and the underrepresented? That's so true. That's, that's a really good question. I think um, when I think about it, I mean, you know, knowing that we live in a very capitalistic society, like it's, it's kind of the, the mode of communication. And if you could look at it that way, not to be very much not a capitalist in that way, but understanding like, if you have a message that you need to get out there, most times it's going to need the mode of capitalism to, to get there. And like, even though brands, you know, brands are multifaceted, some brands are better than others when it comes to getting messages out there in the right way. And I think some brands turn into people and the way people are actually connected to them and connected to the things in our life. But for me, it's like outside of things and products and selling people an idea, like what, what are the things that's going to be a constant and like, 
if, even if this brand didn't exist, what is the idea that needs to put out there? Mm. And that's the way I think about it. I'm just like, okay, like I'm getting an exchange of money, right? To, mm -hmm. to do what I think is beneficial for a community at mm -hmm. large. Um, but knowing that like, it's not just about that end of it, but it's more so like who could be impacted by it. So it's like, it's kind of like a slippery slope. Like you kind of have to go down it because if you do nonprofit work, then it's expected and not saying nonprofit work isn't powerful. I think nonprofit work is impactful and powerful in its own way. But if you want to get to a different type of audience to understand and, and have an open mind or open heart, or at least kind of give them this, this journey of what that could look like, um, you have to work with the right brands. So for me, like, I just, I always want to make sure I'm working with the right people at the right brands. So mm -hmm. it's not even just about the right company, but who's right. presenting the idea, who they are, their identity, their ideology, their vision, but as well as like the people that are involved along the process. Because sometimes you can have the right brand par to partner up with, but it's the right, it's the wrong person delivering it. Yeah. You know, they, they probably don't understand the, the full on idea and how impactful and sensitive it could be. But what do you do when you're like, when you're a young gun, right? And you don't have the, sometimes you don't have the luxury of saying no, right? You're trying to make yeah, this you know. a living. So there's a power dynamic that exists, right? I mean, it's, so yeah, it's the better power. to stick your guns morally and be like, yeah. no, like the money will come eventually in some sort of other way. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, that was with the McDonald's thing. It was just like, no, because like mm -hmm. this is this is obviously a very trendy um, project just because you saw the success and you feel like you can monetize on the black vision and black creative in a sense. But um, I think the power of no and saying no is like one of the best things that you could stand by, even though, you know, I was living in my parents' house anyway. So wasn't like I had a crazy overhead, um, but it, it kind of built integrity in why I would say yes to things and also why I would say no. Mm, interesting. Another question was for you, Josh. How did you keep yourself confident as the first person creating a different storyline, especially when coming up with different ideas later on? So how did you stick to your guns when you felt like everyone was giving you shit for it? Um, man, I mean, I just go inwards. I go into family, I go into my faith, I go into um, the things that are constant, right? in my life um, because even though creativity is beautiful and, and working is beautiful when it comes to those things, I think there are constant things that inspire me way beyond just the craft. And I'm just like, okay, like just because I've been blessed to be creative, like if I wasn't doing this, like these are the things that would be important to me, my family, my wife, of course, the people in my life that I love and those moments and experiences you have within community. So like, mm -hmm. I always thought about like, what's the larger vision? What's the long term? Um, in order to steer myself in the right direction when it came to saying no to those opportunities, I was just like, okay, like I know I'm doing this for the right reason. Um, Cause I'm being present and this is what my heart is telling me. Um, mm -hmm. And of course I'll get feedback and, and advice from friends and, and loved ones as well. If I had a, a very difficult time with that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just go back to centering myself and the people I love. Yeah. Okay. So last two questions. What work do you want to see by black and brown creatives that you're not seeing out there right now? How would oh, you like to see them organize? Man, that's a good question. That's a really good question. There's a ton of great work happening right now. Um, yeah, there's so many great work. There's a lot of great work, but it's not all getting the same exposure and visibility. And like, as we know, social media is built on visibility. Like who sees mm -hmm. what, how much they see it, at mm. what rate, at what reach. Yeah. Sometimes that could be difficult to- The privilege of the on. algorithm. I know, seriously. And it's, yeah. it's difficult to think of your art form and creativity in terms of just on whether or not it reaches people on social media, right? But I think the work needs to be done in person, but as well as through your art form. So I would love to see more actual in real life events around these conversations and topics and not just like, you know, Instagram posts with, you know, thousands of likes and a lot of comments, but like, how are we showing up in person? Because sometimes we get sucked into our phone life, but not into like our actual life. And it's like, how do we make sure those topics and conversations are actually being implemented in how we live? Um, mm. Cause that's what art's supposed to do, right? It's supposed to move you, it's supposed to yeah. kind of st steward you towards a direction that you maybe you didn't think was ex um, possible. Um, so I just think that I wanna see more black and brown creatives definitely do more work online which is great but also more activations and events that could bring us together because yeah. when people actually come together that's when like the magic happens for me personally that's wow yeah and I, that kind of like naturally segues into the last question which is really interesting actually because it i guess in some ways is super is poignant to you and how do you create a brand out of your writing photography or art mm -hmm. not as a means of elevating your own status but getting yeah. your work out there so it reaches more people and makes that impact 
a lot of people struggle with navigating between ego and art but like a lot of art created right now leverages from the self from the ego right like ego. we sell ourselves like there's no street etiquette without joshua kissy yeah yeah right and how do you strike that balance between like wanting to do good but also like realizing that you have to leverage yourself at the same time no that's a really good question i think um like you said, like art starts with yourself, right? And what I always tell myself, like it shouldn't end with yourself. Like if your art starts with yourself and ends with yourself, that means that it wasn't big enough, right? It needs to impact other people you don't know, other people you do know. And I always try to think like, okay, if if I come up with an idea and it's, it's strictly just for me, right? Then I think that means that I need to rethink that idea and think of how it could impact more people and what it means um, as well, because I think having a personal brand is great, but it's like, you have to figure out a way to continue to be a voice and not just an echo. Mm -hmm. Like an echo is like, you hear it continuously. That's what kind of everybody's doing. But like, mm -hmm. how do you make sure you're sticking by what you truly believe in? Mm -hmm. Even if it's only 10 people that believe in what you're doing in your art, yeah. that's power. Like, even if it's yeah. one person, that's power. 100%. Yeah. Because you yeah. may have a lot of followers, but like maybe only 10% of them actually really believe in what you do. or 100%. really. Yeah. So I think, that's always the thing. People follow things for different reasons. Yeah. And just because we're in this follow culture, it kind of skews like what art and creativity could look like for ourselves. And I think like we need to use that as a benefit and use it as a leverage. Yeah. But like, like I said earlier, like there's nothing on a social media feed that could actually feed you. Right. Yeah. So hundred <laughs> percent. And I think like, actually some of the most favorite work and accounts that I follow right now are like aren't in the three figures or the six figures uh, follow accounts and they're actually really like low key. And uh, I think your point about focusing on that audience of 10 before a thousand is really yeah. key. Josh, man, like I knew like there'd be a lot to take from this. I, you, I told you it'd be an hour. I've taken an hour and 20 of your time. I'm really sorry, but there was just so much to get through. And I'm a hundred percent certain that everyone here has taken lots of things from this, uh, this talk. And we're so grateful for you. No, I'm, so much. I'm also hope it's not the last time you'll bless us in this space. Uh, <laughs> no, it definitely won't be. I'll be tuning in more. It was literally, literally a pleasure. Thank everybody for spending this hour and a half in your home, in your places of comfort. I really hope that everybody's families and loved ones are doing well during this time. And I just, I'm just really, really grateful to, to, to speak about my journey in a way that could impact others. So like, this is an honor. This is a pleasure. I love what you're doing. You're like the greatest person I've ever met. Like, <laughs> stop. You know, like, like no, no, I'm saying bro. like your gift, your gift for people, community, creativity oh, man. is bar none. You know what I mean? And I love yeah. the fact that you also share that light with others who inspire you, but as well as people you don't know. And I think that's important. So please continue to do that. Thank this. you, brother. That means a lot. But we, we learn from your light, man. And seriously, we appreciate you and keep shining and we'll be in touch and uh, keep, keep kind of blessing us with that inspiration, bro. Seriously, like I'm not even, it means a lot to have you in the space. Thank you, brother. No, thank you, bro. Honestly, thank you. Yeah. Everybody have a good one. Take, Take it care. Easy. Thank you guys for all tuning in. I appreciate it. And uh, I'll see you on the internet. Follow me. I'll, I'll respond back to any further questions you may have. At Joshua Kissy, you could DM me, whatever it is, and I'll, I'll respond back for sure. But thank you so much for taking the time out to talk about the work. My bro. Everyone, clap in for Josh. <laughs> hey. I appreciate that. I appreciate that so much. Appreciate see you, brother. That. Take care. Take care. Whoa, right. Um, I mean, like that was probably one of the ones I was looking forward to the most. I always knew Joshua. Well, I was really glad because like Joshua means a lot to me um, as a mentor, as a friend, as a role model. He's been one of the biggest supporters and facilitators and someone when I've been feeling down, he really propped me up and made me feel like my work was valid. And it's not easy to be like a pioneer, but also a facilitator and a role model and a mentor to so many people. And I was really looking forward to bringing him into the space because I know a lot of you are aspirational creators or you're people trying to figure out what your transition is from passion to implementation to institutional change. And I hope that kind of gave you some sort of avenues to imagine what that might look like for you guys in the future. I'm really grateful you guys are here again. And, um, you know, every week we... We bring, we bring the good, good stuff. And I hope you'll join the next Caravan Sarai, which will be sadly the last one. Um, um, and, uh, you know, it's sad, but they've been really amazing. And it's just been a blessing and an opportunity to kind of share that with you. But thank you guys for being here. And I love you guys a lot. And uh, I'll leave you to kind of socialize in this group as long as you like. But thank you for joining in. And I appreciate you. Take care. Until next time.
Bye. Can't work out how to leave. <laughs> so, so do the the chats that happen afterward also get broadcasted live, or am I just watching? Oh, that's why everyone's silent. It's still on YouTube. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right, guys, take care. Have a good one. Bye.